Hi, Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang for Friday and uh, someday at the end of the world. Um, so far, we're going well. There's a lot of rain, but uh, uh, nothing much else. Okay, so uh, we've got a, a short and sweet show today, uh, starting with the uh, infamous uh, star of uh, This Week in Startups, uh, Robert Scoble. <laughs> You're so bitter, man. I, bitter. I have the memory of the an world elephant. is gonna end. <laughs> I have the memory figured, of an Irish elephant. I figured the world was gonna end, so I might as well go on a competitive show. Yeah. At, at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> at the same time, it might end all at once. Nice. <laughs> I, I I don't know that it's competitive. Jason and Steve, not the same kind of people at all. Well, Jason used to be on the uh, Gilmore Gang from time to time. You know, he was very funny. Yeah. I liked him. Just different. <laughs> 2012. Okay, and uh, the chuckle uh, that you just heard, did, did we see Keith? We saw Keith, but let's Okay, well, that's Keith Tierra. Welcome, Keith. Hi. And the other British guy is, uh, is Kevin Marks. Hi there. How are you? I'm good. I'm so uh, it's not actually rain on me while I'm out here. But I'm sorry, I couldn't. I, I talked over you. I'm just hoping it's not going to rain on me while I'm out here, but that should be okay. Is the world ending around him? Yeah. The world as he knows it is going to be even replaced by a new world. You know, when you're British, that's a warm summer day that he's sitting in right there. <laughs> exactly. All so right. Steve, Matthew Maurice just called me an asshole on Twitter, so there you go. For what reason? I don't. He, he was watching another show and said, "I'm a bigger asshole than he even thought." <laughs> <laughs> what was the other show? Uh, Leo reports one on Sunday. Oh, you're on that as yeah. as, as uh, right now simultaneously. Uh, no, it's uh, recorded. You know. <laughs> oh, this is like last week or something. <laughs> yeah, Sunday. <laughs> you, you know what I always say, Robert, is you got to embrace and extend your critics. So if he says you're a big asshole, you got to disagree and say, "No, I'm a way bigger asshole than you think." Uh, absolutely. I retweeted him, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What does it say right now? Rackspace? Well, well, well no, let's leave it that way. <laughs> Rackspace is sponsoring the show. We love Rackspace. Okay. So, um, uh, Robert Scoble, what's, uh, what's floating your boat this, uh, this week? I don't know. I, Instagram getting into a privacy or uh, not privacy and uh, uh, terms of service flap that caused all sorts of angst. Um, we've had some interesting gun control debates. <laughs> um, I continue getting uh, dozens and dozens of updates on my apps. Um, I don't know. Uh, this week I, I visited Facebook. I guess that's the biggest thing for me personally. And uh, there. Uh, so I met with seven executives there, from photos to news feed to uh, engineering to other places. And they're clearly uh, preparing for a, a battle with, with Google over a contextual future. And I was talking with a certain executive this morning over at Google, and they're doing the same. <laughs> so I think the next year is going to be this contextual future. In other words, I... Uh, uh, how do you take the signals that we're putting into the world um, off of sensors, off of our wearable computers, off of our social network behaviors, off of our mapping behaviors, you know, searching for locations, off of our calendar, off of our email, and how do you build systems that uh, serve us and, uh, and do new kinds of products? Uh, I think that's going to be the uh, defining thing of the next year. You don't think that's already happening? Oh, it is. I mean, Google Now is already out there. What's um, Google Now? A, a, a system that watches your behavior on an Android tablet, but soon Google Chrome, um, and starts telling you you better leave for a meeting uh, now because it, the traffic is getting bad, um, and tells you things about your world. About Robert, your, your tablet's going off right now. It's just telling you to get to leave to get ready for one o'clock exactly there's google, there's google now so you really exactly. think that that's going to be functional well tom Fremsky, yeah uh you think that's going to be functionally uh, useful or is it going to be it already something is that you try and uh basically defeat because it doesn't 
really understand now, who you are. No, Google Now is actually pretty useful already. I, you know, it's um, it's it's in in the Apple One days right now. It, it doesn't have a pretty box on it. It doesn't do a lot. But as they add more and more features to these things, it it certainly will do a lot more. I Facebook. Several of the executives talked about predictive things, predictive inventories, based on you know for a store based on um, they know what you're going to buy uh, or the crowd is going to buy. And they know so if you're a sushi restaurant and you're using Open Table and you know how many people are coming in tonight, um, you know how much inventory to buy for tonight. Uh, and, and on and on and on. Um, these predictive systems are going to become smart in the next year, and that's um, going to be pretty interesting. Well, that sounds like uh, the deal that's purportedly underway with uh, Apple and uh, Foursquare, right? Same thing? Well, it, absolutely. Apple needs more data on the maps. It's, it, it, the more it knows about the world, the better it can serve you as you do searches, as you walk around, and they're going to be they're already working on uh, wearable computing because Google's wor working on them and they can't let Google just have all the fun um, and so next year we're gonna start hearing about Apple's wearable computers and Microsoft already has uh, put some patents in for wearable computers so we're gonna hear about Microsoft's and I already have the Apple wearable computer uh, that's you know, it's sort of funny if you try to wear this right <laughs> well I mean it's in my pocket oh, we got one that's an interesting uh, insight. What, your checkbook cleared? You finally got one? I got one. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you said <laughs> something was interesting? Yeah, because uh, uh, this executive at Google, who will remain unknown, but yeah, you can figure it out. Vic? Uh, yeah, he said, he said, you know, the key insight that he had years ago with, with uh, Larry was that for the first time, our Portable computers have senses. They have ears. They have a microphone. They have eyes. They have a camera. They have skin. You touch them, and they can sense things moving around, and, and so on and so forth. But if you keep it in your pocket, that sent all those sensors are sort of blind or muted. And so that's the insight behind the Google Glasses. It's uh, you know going to be to bring that those senses out out of your pot pocket where they can actually do something for you. So it's well, the opposite but, you know, of Vic, keeping it Vic, in your uh, pants. I don't know if Vic is the Google Glasses guy. Uh, I don't know if even Vic believes in Google Glasses. But I, my own opinion is Google Glasses are nuts. And no one's going to wear them or buy them. And even if they were cheap, no That's one would wear true. them or they, buy them. That's not true. Out of 7,000 developers at the Google I.O. conference, 2,500 people bought them in one day at $1,500 a pair. So yeah, because the developers, the developers, developers. I'm talking about real people. I, you know, when developers build stuff, eventually end users get on board because they build cool stuff that people want to do. I'm already seeing this kind of stuff. There's a game called Ingress on the Android phone that you play as you walk around. And it makes much more sense to play that game when you're wearing a computer than if you're looking around while you're walking around, looking I, into a device. I, I believe that it makes sense to play that game wearing the glasses. That means no one's going to play the game because no one's going to wear the glasses. I, I honestly don't buy the glasses. I'll bet you $100. So Sergey has had a kind I'll of I'll bet a, you $100 they uh, sell a million. Brain but they're $1,000. dollars and, and he's aren't kind they? of going off on a crazy limb. I'll, I'll bet you they sell a hundred, a, a million in the first year, and I'll bet you $100 on that. Millions, nothing. I, I would agree they might sell a million, but you got to sell a hundred million even to be relevant. Well, in what time frame? I mean, I, you know, tablet PCs. I heard the same bullshit about tablet PCs when I first got into tablet PCs in 2002. And I had a tablet PC that was a quarter inch thick. Uh, it had a glass surface, no keyboard. It, it had Wi Fi. You walked around with it, you could do things with it. Yeah, they didn't sell very many back then. They, I think we sold 2,000 a month was a good month for, for us back then. But guess what? Steve Jobs comes along and, pr and productizes that, and reduces the price, makes yeah, it but, useful, I mean, but Robert, makes the interfaces nice, and has a distribution system that it can explain them to customers. And it took nine years. So no, if, if you're going like to say saying, in 10 years you're not going to go mainstream with these things, I think you're absolutely wrong. Uh, I think that uh, you know, you're both right, uh, but Robert, you're wrong as far as uh, uh, you know, saying that the uh, iPad was the, uh, uh, the you know, you know, 3.0 version of the uh, Microsoft uh, system. You know, this, the Microsoft thing was a failure. 
It was a failure because they did uh, something like six things wrong, right? They didn't get rid of the UI of Windows because they were stuck on Windows. We called it strategy taxes inside Microsoft. They couldn't reduce the cost of under $500 because they weren't willing to get rid of uh, expensive processors and cameras. The first iPad didn't have a camera on it. They weren't willing to screw their developers and get rid of multitasking. Apple did that. They weren't willing to fire Best Buy, who should have been fired because Best Buy was never going to be able to explain them to customers and display them properly. And they never were able to build their own store. And, and so their business model sucked. Uh, the, you know, the whole partner uh, relationship with uh, third-party developers and hardware Absolutely. manufacturers doesn't work. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, Google has done a better job of it with the Nexus series, but they're still struggling with the same issues. Yeah. So, so what you're telling me? Flipboard is, is just yesterday shipped on Android tablets. So, uh, Android, uh, it's clear that it's still Android on Google. For months. What's that? Flipboard's been Android tablets for months. It no, it hasn't. It. It's they shipped has. on the 10 inch yesterday. It was the they 10 inch. Shipped, they shipped the the tablet edition, which iPad has always had. That I I. I what you got on Android was the iPhone edition, the, sh the version for small screens. Yesterday, they shipped both versions. You now have a choice on Android of the big screen experience or the small screen experience. There's a problem with Android. They, they, do not, they did not force the developers to separate out a big screen experience and a small screen experience. They tried to make it so that you developed once and built it for both UIs. And it doesn't, it doesn't work the same. I, you know, the, my Android tablet all of a sudden is bet now. But back, back to the glasses. I, I disagree. Back I think Apple's got it backwards. Hang on. One at a time. I believe the glasses Keith. are Google's Newton. It, it, you know, it's just the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place at the wrong price point for the wrong audience. Okay. Let, let's, uh, uh, let's. However, Android, Android is awesome. And, and uh, if you think about Google's opportunity in this contextual space versus Facebook's, I wouldn't bet a cent on Facebook because they don't own the device and they can't go deep in the OS on this stuff. Yeah. Uh, yep. Ke Kevin, hang on a second. I said Kevin, keys. you were saying something. I'm, I'm saying that the Android thing is better than this shitty experience that I'm getting on the, the iPad with the Flickr app. Uh, it's a tiny little thing what does that mean? Uh, you know, Robert's saying, oh, what Android got it wrong. Android got it right. Um, Flickr? And, Android means that you can run stuff at, at multiple screen sizes, and because they started with multiple screen sizes, developers had to cope with it. And yeah, you can actually do more if you if you know that you've got a bigger a bigger screen. You know, there's hooks in there to do that. Yeah. But the iOS is now the fragmented one. iOS is now like, oh, you're running an iPhone app on here. Doesn't that feel like? Doesn't that feel shitty? I have to double it up. Oh, no, it's all pixely. Or I can run it that that size, and, and yeah. it looks like it's lost. So Got I a good think. Point. I, yeah. you know, Apple now uh, has I think that's stretching a point. I, it is pushing uh, point. I mean, you're there's pushing three, the limits there. There's I mean, 400,000 uh, apps on Apple there. really isn't head. fragmented. It's just that Flickr hasn't shipped a universal app yet. And, and Android really yeah, is neither fragmented. Neither has Instagram. Just to pick the stats. So neither has I don't buy that, Kevin. But it's a good, you're making a good rhetorical and, you know, point. Word, per, Word Perfect good. hasn't shipped uh, you know, a, a, an iOS brand either. Because they're out of business. Because they guessed wrong on uh, Windows versus uh, OS 2. I mean, you know, there's no, there's no point that you're making here. Except uh, I'm talking about you, Kevin. You're not making a real point. You're just, you're basically taking a, a taking a snapshot in time, and the dynamics of uh, maybe the point you're trying to make is is the the dynamics of uh, releasing uh, software, which is the platform that you release first on in an intelligent way, uh, maybe shifting to include uh, Android, but it sure as hell isn't. Uh, you know the experience of uh, uh, shipping on Android. Like, what about where's my corporate email on Android? Well, um, well that's a, that's our corporation's decision not to not to use it. I mean, yeah, and and we're the only ones that d don't do that. There's they're behind the times in terms of their uh, ability to be able to capture the imagination of IT. Let me put it that way. Um, by by the way, the, the Flickr mean, the, the, app actually, does have yeah, a secret weapon, uh, not safe for work warning. You can do porn searches on it. <laughs> well, thanks for that contribution. <laughs> actually, that you just reminded me of something else this week. That, that that was the other thing that happened this week was that Google dropped support for Microsoft Exchange, 
the, the Gmail. That, that was interesting. I yeah. agree. So what's that about? That's about competition between Google and uh, Microsoft. Yeah. Microsoft, right. Yeah. But, okay. that, but the, the, they were saying, okay, um, we no longer need to support this legacy proprietary protocol that Microsoft insists on because um, Android and iOS are, are big enough and support the open protocols and we, we can actually get away with ditching this, um, maintaining this Microsoft thing now. Um, you know, and there won't be there won't be too much outcry only from the sort of tiny minority of people who. I think it's more. Phones. I think it's more of a uh, just a jab at uh, at Windows 8 and uh, Surface and all that stuff. They're yeah, basically Google, saying they've got. It's, no, it's a jab win at Windows Phone primarily. Yeah, yeah but it, it, Windows Phone and Windows 8. You know, yeah. they're saying basically that the market is with Windows 7. They're not going to switch. Uh, nobody cares. Uh, so we're not going to invest any uh, in, any effort. Uh, in our development stream, in order to support somebody who we're trying to compete against, right? Okay, well, I agree. That's a that's an indication of Google uh, moving against their original model, which is you know web everybody. Yeah, well, not quite. I mean, because the, the web stuff is still there. You you know what they're saying is, well, you can use Gmail on the web on these devices now. Their web support is good enough. Um, so we don't need to sort of jump through hoops to support their web proprietary protocols um, anymore. And yeah, plus, but I think that's, even I think people that's wrong. with Exchange servers so that, that supports POP and IMAP these days. So they can get, they can certainly get their email without support for Exchange. They can probably get their calendars now without support <coughs> for Exchange. The only thing they'll probably miss is their contact list, and that can sync well, the into the phone's contact list anyway. <coughs> calendars, I agree. <coughs> calendars <coughs> is is vulnerable, but. Uh, uh, I don't think that email is vulnerable yet, uh, fundamentally. And I also don't think that the Gmail, uh, you know, it doesn't support Gtalk, for example, on mobile devices, uh, except, uh, you know, the proprietary Android system. So, um, do you like that? See how I did that? Well, no, G Gtalk is, is Jabber, so, you know, it's, it's, you, you, can, you can use it an arbitrary client on that. I actually but, found something that... Uh, iOS is just shy to chat. That's, I, you know. I actually found something this week. Uh, what is it? Iridium or Telelium or... What's the universal uh, chat client? Um, I don't know. There's several. Trillion. Okay. Yeah, the Trillion uh, client works with Gtalk and push notifications. Uh, not, on, on iOS. not completely oh. on iOS. So uh, the only reason that I have for going back to the uh, um, uh, to the Nexus Seven is now eliminated, uh, and I get all my corporate emails. So thank you, uh, you know, the Apple Microsoft access. Another uh, uh, interesting move was the one reported regarding uh, uh, WebKit and Microsoft. Do you know about that one, Kevin? You yeah. want to explain that? So what 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 happened is there's um, there's two sets of um, APIs for for touch events in HTML5. Uh, there's Apple's one um, and there's Microsoft's one. Now Apple's one has a bunch of patent stuff tied up with it, and so there's some wariness about whether that can be shipped in other browsers. Um, so what Microsoft has done is take their um, touch API that they developed for um, IE and ported that API to WebKit so that it could be potentially deployed on Chrome, Safari, Android, and iOS. Um, and this, this, that, that is interesting. It's significant. It's, it's basically the same thing that um, Adobe has been doing. Adobe switched from writing plugins in Flash to writing stuff that runs inside WebKit um, so that they can do their visual effects as part of HTML, and then everyone else will ship it for them if it gets taken to the main port. So Microsoft has submitted a patch to WebKit for the... Um, the, the what I think they call pointer events, which are sort of a mixture of um, basically it's a way of, of doing events that um, could be a, a mouse click or could or a uh, you know touchpad or could be a touch event. Um, so it's it's um, it means that you know part of the reason they did that is they've got devices that have both, whereas you know, Apple has one or the other. Although I suppose you, in theory you can plug a mouse into into right. one of Right. So the the question is you know it, it looks like Apple is going to refuse to support this. Uh, that they're just basically going to go with their own proprietary uh, format. And my question would be, is that a smart decision for them? My answer would be yes. What's yours? Um, well, the, the, the smart decision for them would be to um, disclaim the patents on those touch things so that other people can support them too. 
um, rather than saying, okay, we, we own all these kinds of touch events and you can't use them on any other platform. Because people want to, if we're writing a web app, you want to respond to touch on more than one platform. And well, that's the bit where this is sticky. Uh, my my uh, sense of this, and I want to get Robert in on this, is that uh, the real reason that they're not supporting this and won't uh, is because they're, they're protecting airplay. In other words, mm. the TV uh, takedown, which they at the moment control. I think, I think that's, that's all talking about. I think airplay is, is something else entirely. Oh, I, I, I totally agree with you. I'm just saying that. You know, they said that they were going to open uh, AirPlay, and at the moment, uh, I see no reason why they would want to open AirPlay uh, to allow other platforms to cannibalize their lead in terms of moving to television. Well, they'll, they'll open it in, in the licensing terms, like they you know open the the iPhone connector. So it'll be a deal you do with Apple. It won't be an open an actual open space. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm okay what, with that. What is the uh, relationship between WebKit and Apple? Because Apple doesn't own WebKit, right? Apple is a is a is a it's one a of the vendors that uses WebKit. Yes. Am I right? Yeah, WebKit's an open source project um, that was started by Apple. It was um, it was based on a a, um, a different browser that from long ago, but it's it's basically it's the core web engine that's inside um, Safari and the iOS browser, and also the Android browser and Chrome. Um, right, so Apple I think a doesn't couple of have to well. accept the Microsoft stuff, um, but the Microsoft stuff could still benefit from being inside WebKit uh, yes. on, on, in, in a whole bunch of other ways. And theoretically, that could lead Microsoft in the future to adopt WebKit as its core engine instead of what it uses in IE. Um, yeah, I yes. don't think that's what they're doing, though. I think they're, they're doing that, a, that, That's not what they're doing. But embrace it's and extend uh, you know, do, yeah. uh, 2012. You know, the Mayan uh, embrace and extend model. Well, no, I think you know it's it's them realizing that they can't insist that they they own the you know before they would ship this feature in IE and everyone would go right we've got to write the code twice once for IE and once for everybody else and what they're now they're seeing is they no longer have the power to force people to do that um, and so they're saying okay we'll submit this code to the open source base so it can then run on everything else as well which is you know it's basically what Adobe's been doing over the past couple of years now. Right, they're trying they're, to they're trying all the, all the, to. They're trying to, uh, you know, isolate Apple uh, by partnering with Google. That's what they're doing. Uh, not, not really. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're behaving well in an open source way. They're trying to, whatever that means. They're, they're, they're saying, okay, we, we're con we're contributing this. We've contributed this to the the HTML5 spec, um, and we've contributed a version of it to, to WebKit so that you can um, just accept that patch and have it working in a bunch of other browsers. Which is the same thing that Adobe's been doing with this, the CSS effects. They've been saying we want CSS effects that are like the things we used to be able to do in Illustrator, or whatever, um, different kinds of blends and compositions. Um, and so we're going to submit the code to WebKit so that we can have it running um, in Safari or yeah. Uh, Lose, whatever. Losers always uh, flock to standards, uh, you know, when it's, it's too late. No. <laughs> Robert, do you think that my airplane? So, so hang on, is, so so that makes Apple a loser because they started WebKit in the first place. Uh, I don't quite understand. I, I don't. Dis I completely disagree with that no, I, statement. I think I don't know, think they're a loser at all. I think they're smart. The world yeah. tends to start out with uh, closed interfaces. The Macintosh was a great example of that, and eventually, open interfaces or more open interfaces tend to beat those. I, Windows eventually beat out Macintosh even though Windows didn't feel as good all the way through the system because it, it let developers do things that and uh, other companies do things that um, Apple wasn't willing to let the market do. I, I think we're seeing the same thing on Android. I, you know, we're, there's six, six or seven major phone companies competing and building things, and I, I think that's starting to pay off. I really do. I, I, you know, six out of every seven devices right now sold as an Android device. It's certainly paying off uh, in terms of uh, uh, of momentum for the platform, but in terms of real dollars uh, flowing through the platform, uh, it's it's having almost a negligible, the opposite effect. Actually, uh, it's the, it's even worse than that, Steve. Uh, for every Android user that no longer uses desktop, Google is losing about. Um, uh, you know the CPM for an ad on desktop is three seventy five. Uh, on on uh, Android, it's seventy five cents. So for every user that moves to a mobile device from previously using desktop, Google's losing about eighty percent of its former revenue from that user, and not getting any revenue in return from the purchase of the phone. 
I agree with that. Uh, I also think that. Uh, which uh, yeah, which is I why think Google is making mass. mistakes, uh, continuing to make mistakes in that uh, mobile area, by you know, for example, Google Plus doesn't allow you the same kind of onboarding of uh, content. Uh, you know, drag and drop, uh, push the like button, you know, all that kind of stuff uh, that works on the desktop. So the desktop's going away, mobile is coming, and they are basically down-leveling their mobile platform to a, a pale imitation of what they already are uh, innovating on. So I think that they're, you know, they've got real trouble in terms of, uh, of harnessing this, uh, you know, the, the Android uh, momentum. And that's a good segue to what Instagram did this week, because Instagram and Facebook are facing the same problem, which is their users are more and more mobile, and they're having to force feed inappropriate ads into the feeds just to be able to, for every ad that you still have on desktop, they've got to have seven on mobile to be equal That's a temporary problem, Keith, according to their, uh, their teams. They, they see a new kind of advertising coming, one that's very, very contextual, and, uh, you know, it's funny, I, The Verge just uh, printed an article that said we actually got a worse system by going back to the old terms of service because the new terms of service was actually going to explain and delineate what's going on a, a, a bit more. But they're going to, so if I take a picture of you at Squaw Valley and, uh, and that photo comes back in the display and there's an open table uh, ad for the lunch place that we're going to have lunch at and there's uh, you know and there's going to be some some other things that happen with that photo that's that's going to happen and it can it can still happen with the old terms of service by the way in fact the old terms of service gives them more ability to put ads on displays than the new terms of service did uh, yeah. i think uh, users but, don't understand uh, what they're reading Robert, that's the problem i was kind of more interested in the underlying drivers of even going there than I am in the details of the implementation of the rights. The underlying drivers of going there are, you know, not a lot of clear thinking about the intimacy of a mobile device and, and what a revenue model sh could represent on mobile. It's one thing to put an ad when the screen's two feet away from you or ten feet away from you, but when the screen is in your hand, it can't be the same experience and they're force feeding roughly the same experience they're just being clever about how to do it but it's still gonna piss us all off you know these systems are gonna have to be paid for somehow I, you know the, I, I, I've I been in the that, that Facebook data center innovation. it's I mean, a billion it's dollar organic data to the platform one at a time please sorry who sh was I talking over Robert I yeah. apologize That's go ahead right. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say it's got to be as organic to the platform as AdSense was to search. Yes. Uh, and, and I don't think anyone's yet come up with intimate and organic uh, consumer facing messaging that, that is supporting a brand's relationship to that consumer. Uh, that is true. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of experimentation over the next year on a advertising. I think the fact that we now know who you are, where you are, what your behavior is, what your history is, what your family structure is, what your religion is, what your politics are, what you, what music you listen to. We the systems know so much about you that they can do a new kind of advertising and make it very interesting to users. I think so. I'm I'm betting against targeting as the solution. Uh, it's I, not I, just I do targeting. I agree with you that it is possible to target because it's of not the just details. targeting. It's targeting at the right time, at the right context. That's Squaw Valley's story. You know, my, my, my calendar is going to figure out very quickly that I eat lunch by 1 o'clock every day. And if it's 1.15 and I'm on the slope and I take a picture of you skiing, it's going to come back and say, hey, you haven't had lunch yet. Would you like us to make a reservation at y your favorite place? Uh, and it's going to know where we are, and it's going to bring those three choices that we have on the mountain. Up. Yeah, but I, I think that I think that you're uh, you're both sort of wallowing uh, in the current model in terms of trying to anticipate where it's going to go. I think that the, what's actually happening uh, already is that uh, people will reward uh, uh, appropriately immediate real time information that they either are looking for or didn't know they were looking for and were alerted to it 
they will reward that with their attention. And that based on that connection, the little sort of micro connection that is set up about that information and the, that user or group of users is going to be the economic model. So, yes. you know, it, it's not advertising. It's something else. It's engagement. It's a direct uh, emotional and economic connection. It's, you know, if you've got already got, uh, you know, the... Um, when I bought the uh, the iPad Mini, I bought it on the app Apple Store app on the iPhone 5. Yeah, uh, I I pushed two buttons. It knew what my uh, uh, credit card information was. Yeah, it, it knew my address, where to ship it, it etc. I just, I pushed two buttons and I was done. That's, no, I, so, that's so I agree. Uh, the model the key, that's going to work. I think the key to what you said, Steve, is um, intimacy implies relationships, and relationships imply a two-way, a two-way reward system. The, 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 uh, and, and that's not advertising in the traditional sense. It's not pushed at you um, without you desiring it to be, or being rewarded by it immediately. No, and it's the opposite. That, it's here, the opposite. You, here's you're gonna, something you're I did. Resent being pushed information that you uh, that is cluttering up your ability to see Here, past you. Here's yeah. something I did this week. My, my friend Sam Levin got engaged this week and I went to Facebook, clicked on his name and clicked buy him a gift. I bought him some chocolates. Um, by the way, the, the gift system on Facebook is pretty interesting. So when I sent him the chocolates, I did not need to put his address in. I didn't know, need to know where he lived. It sent him a message. Would you like this box of chocolates? Sure, you would like a box of $40 chocolates. And then if he doesn't like the chocolates I give him and he wants a bottle of champagne, he could switch it on the back end. I never see that, so I never get the signal that he didn't really like my gift, but he'll use that money. He could even donate that money to a charity. Um, and, it, and it all delivers it to him. Facebook then also, when he takes a picture of that box of chocolates and says, man, th these chocolates are really good, it can hook that third piece of data up to uh, the store. And it knows now that he loves chocolates because he emoted that on Facebook. He, it knows his credit card or it knows my credit card. It knows his address. And now he's, he's uh, um, integrated into the system. And it, now he, he knows that he can buy other people chocolates or whatever on the store. It's, it's a pretty brilliant idea. So take that system that on to back on the skiing. I want to, you know, if we're skiing at a mountain or I'm looking at a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge, we're walking across the Golden Gate Bridge and we're getting hungry. Hey, where should we go? Uh, let's go to uh, the Scomas in Sausalito. Uh, it can talk in live time to somebody at Scomas, find out if there's a seat there and we get that ans answer already on our phones. That this system has such huge monetization potential that has been to largely untapped so far that it's crazy for me to think that it's not it, it's going to be that way in the future. I, you know, this is just going to get more and more and more like Uber every single day. And by the end of the, when we have Gilmore Gang in a year, if I'm still alive, we're going to have, you know, a discussion about how everything has been Uberized. Well, I agree with everything that I heard you say. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to be doing it on my glasses. Now, Ke Keith is going to say those look geeky and he's going well, to be I mean, Keith's right. Keith's right. I, I don't he want I, any more uh, obstructions in the way of my inability to see anything. <laughs> uh, I, like it's just I don't want it. I, I've already got... Uh, I can't see as well out of this eye as I can out of this eye. And so, is it going to be on so this I side? No. Is it going to be on this side? No. I wore the Oakley ski goggles and saw what they showed. It has a display surface right about here. It does not even uh, obscure anything in, in your sight of line. And it gives you a lot of data. It tells you where you are on the mountain. It tells you uh, how to get to the best next best run. It shows you your friends on the mountain. It shows you your family members. And by the way, they don't even need to have the glasses. They just need to have an Android or yeah, not. I'm, in I'm, their pocket. I'm going to buy that one where I don't need it. That's They're the sold out, by the way. They're sold out. You can't so, buy them so at $60. I, I, um, so I totally uh, buy you know, the Oakley thing. Because the Oakley thing, you're going to be wearing those mountain. things anyway. 
So it's wearing those things with something hey, extra. That we're both plus. wearing these. That isn't the same as the difference between walking around the street without anything and walking around the street with the Google goggles, we're, glasses. We're both they're, wearing they're, these. They're not. We're all wearing glasses. You know, we could have contact lenses or laser surgery. But we're all wearing glasses. There was a time when everyone was stopping wearing glasses, and wearing contact lenses, and we went back to, to wearing these things on our faces. Let let um, my seeing eye dog wear the glasses. Uh, I I don't mind seeing what the dog sees. I don't want to see what I can see. I can't see anything. It, you know, my eyesight sucks. Why yeah, but do I want to? Why do so I want to enhance my lenses. eyesight? I don't. I don't get. Yeah, it. I, I went to the op the opticians yesterday, the ophthalmologist yesterday, to get new glass, get my eyesight checked again, and you know, looking at the range of glasses and the prices of them and, and so on, I can totally see these things being sold in in that realm. Oh, I agree with that. The, you know, the price range is the same. The other thing that struck me was is um, how sort of you know, ephemeral, the, you know, what will people wear, um, how everyone is wearing big over-the-ear headphones now. Um, not, not the little, little earbud ones like I'm, I've got on, but yeah. I, I went to the Monster Audio thing yesterday and they, all they were selling were these gigantic headphones that look like, you know, studio cans or even slightly smaller ones in bright colors and very, you know, kid-friendly. I'm not sure I understand your point. The point is... Um, I don't see a lot of those on the airplanes head, or uh, walking down the street. No, oh, you, you, you hang up with a younger crowd. But th these kind of headphones are, 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 are vanishing in favor of people wearing big things that look to us like weird studio headphones from the 70s, but look to the teenagers, that they look cool. Yeah, um, it so, may look cool, but... The, but, but, but because they're, they're saying they want a better audio experience, they're, they're willing to wear these, these big, weird-looking cans. Um, whereas right, they want to wear their underwear on the outside of their pants. That doesn't mean that it, so it's I, going to turn into a... <coughs> A Google Glasses. Google underpants, maybe, but not Google Glasses. <laughs> I'm not sure what I think about that one. Well, I'm just pointing out. Uh, I think that Keith's right. I think that there's going to be resistance uh, to Google Glasses because they're obstructive in nature. They uh, block, uh, I think the other way they block the information. Thing. When the information that's coming through that little portal is is more uh, relevant and You're important comparing it just than to the stuff it's like blocking. This. You're looking at the wrong way. These things are going to augment your walking life as like you this. want. Them. Yeah, you know, exactly. That I, that's, that's the difference. So everyone's yeah, doing that now. You're, you're, that's true. And, you know, I've so run into is, people on the street. You don't have to hold your hand up. You have a little thing down you there. Forget Steve, you forget, Steve, that these are actually going to augment your world. I, I, la two weeks ago, I went to Qualcomm and visited the uh, augmented reality uh, labs there and they're doing extraordinary things so you're going to look at a box you know like a product box and it's going to augment it's going to tell you things about the product inside I totally agree with that but it, you know the idea that that's going to be represented by an object that uh, that you're constantly trying to wipe out of your eye because there's some big fly in the upper right hand corner of your eye uh, vision yeah. I mean, I it just I don't think the form I think the form factor sucks. It's like yeah. the remember the Microsoft Watch, uh, where yeah. you know the system was is that you hold it up to the screen, and then you move it around until the, you know I mean it was cool. It was also completely useless, and we all did it for and a now, while. And how many people are wearing Nike Fuel Bands? You know, um, uh, exactly you know? not. It, I'm, they're not wearing Nike eye patches. All right. Well, we're going to see. <laughs> I, I agree with you that they will have a lot of resistance. So did the tablet PC. I remember people saying, I I've had never no zero PC. resistance to the iPad. And no, and by, by the way, in the, the spirit of the PC that was, clip, uh, that was perfect. Uh, right, because you, Robert, the PC part that, of it is that a, contextual is information delivered easily to a person would be very valuable. Yeah. Say that again. I said, uh, in the spirit of the fiscal cliff negotiations, I'd just like to say, and I agree with Robert, that contextual information easily delivered to a person in time and space will be very valuable. The only debate is, how will it be received? Okay, I understood this, but the first part where it was a clever juxtaposition of the fiscal cliff with this, but I don't understand the relationship. What are you saying? Uh, I'm saying, you know, if... if uh, if uh, the Republicans can say it's okay to tax above a million uh, and, and Obama can say it's okay to make cuts 
uh, in other words, compromise with each other to identify common ground, so can we. Right, and so far, <laughs> so far we can't and neither can they. Yes, exactly. Oh, that okay. was my irony. Ah. It's a British thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which he said with irony. And, and not a little sarcasm and uh, disrespect. I appreciate that. Speaking yeah. as a rebel. Uh, By the way, breaking news. Uh, Facebook just shipped a poke app for mobile. I, uh, you know. Jeez. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, yeah. uh, all right. So uh, that's all we need is an app to poke people. I've got about okay. another 15 minutes here and uh, Keith has another 30. So we'll split the difference. So uh, let's, is there anything else that we want to talk about, about the uh, Google glasses or can we move to some other, uh, you know, less interesting topic? You know, the most interesting thing this week was the Instagram stuff, but not because of the uh, crowdsourced opposition that resulted in the change, but more in the strategic angst that it gives rise to. And I, I did a talk in Tokyo last week, and I think I've convinced myself that Google and Facebook's absolute revenues could decline during 2013 if they don't figure out mobile monetization, whereas up until now, it's growth has slowed. But the shift of users onto mobile is so huge now, and the time spent um, not on the desktop is such a minus. But I don't think, you know, as much as I don't think Robert listens to you when you say this, uh, I don't think you listen to Robert when he says that uh, what he thinks is going on right now in terms of mobile. I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, relationship uh uh, I don't want to say uh, you know capturing because it's not it's not really uh, a lock-in kind of st uh, strategy. But there's just I mean the 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 two ecosystems that are of record right now are Google and Apple, and I think they're both having tremendous success uh, at with with Facebook and Amazon also on the playing field. Yeah, uh, but maybe I, not I major think, players. I but. think Facebook, you know, has has the infrastructure in place to be able to do something, but they're not necessarily doing much with it uh, right now, except building share of those relationships. So I think that we're moving from an eyeball share uh, environment to a relationship uh, engagement uh, share. I'd agree with that. Okay, so what are the implications of that? Let's start with Kevin. What are the implications of uh, that in terms of where the dollars are going to start to flow into the system? Um, first. Well, the first, the first thing, obvious thing is, is affiliate rather than advertising. That, that um, by re referring somebody that leads to a lead or a sale um, and being able to trace that back to an individual, that's, that's going to become more important. It's already something we have. Amazon's been providing tools for that for a while. But that's going to, I think that's going to get more significant um, for this. Um, and that will mean that um, you know, us sharing things on, on social media sites will mean that we will potentially get stuff back from that. But the problem with that is that you know, the, the extent to which your shopping uh, becomes your job, uh, <laughs> people are resistant to it. I know I'm resistant to it. I can see that there's, I would never do an affiliate program simply because, you know, uh, if, if that's what I needed to do to make money, there must be better and cheaper and faster ways of making money. Well, yeah, there, there are other ways. That the other ways of making money are, you know, actually being directly paid for things, and we're seeing that get, as you say, that gets easier once we've got the ability to to pay automatically. Um, so that you know, we're seeing things built that make that easier, like you know, like Kickstarter. Um, you know, I suppose in, in you know, well, actually, I think Scoble actually, just sort of answered your uh, or pointed out something by showing the gifts. Aren't right. the gifts a way of being able to do an affiliate model, yeah, but it's a way. So, for, but, but Facebook is getting is it getting is getting all the affiliate dollars there. The, the individuals aren't. So so if you if you break it down, I think there's there's the dollars are in some big piles. There's dollars in selling phones, and there's dollars in selling data plans, and there's dollars in selling apps. Whether there is dollars in delivering content outside of those other three is is currently an open question the answer is 
yes, there are some dollars, but not enough to offset the transition right, now, from hang desktop. On. This is, hang on, hang on. Uh, the, there are huge dollars in making the content. There are people who are making a lot of money in this content thing. So we, we finally finished uh, uh, Breaking Bad. We're caught up to the last uh, uh, season, which is going to ship, I think, in the summer. Uh, that they are getting some inordinate amount of uh, of revenue out of having uh, uh, basically hooked everybody via Netflix and uh, iTunes on the entire series. So right. they've been promoting it in this new windowing model, and now they're cashing in on it in terms of the revenue. So, I, I totally agree with that, okay. and I think Robert's right also that there's dollars in e-commerce and that mobile and e-commerce go together incredibly well. So the only open question is, is there something like advertising dollars available on mobile? And um, uh, Steve, is it okay if I just tell you a little bit about what I'd be doing with just me in that area, or should I not do that? Well, I, I don't understand the question. Why would you... Uh you well, have, you well have so let me tell you, I, I, I've got an insight, <laughs> or, or, or not an insight, uh, but we've, we've, we, we've started to think about um, the, the cell phone is a bit like your home in that it's very intimate, and the thing you hate at home is getting junk mail, but you really like getting mail that you want or have been waiting for. So uh, we, we've, we came to the conclusion that um, the mobile phone and, and opted in relationships, a little bit like Facebook fans, but except a much more engaged relationship because you're on a message-based device. Um, that probably is a relationship-based future, but like Doc Searle says, it has to be a relationship entered into by the consumer who manages the vendors that they relate to, not the other way around. And there's a secret part of the cell phone that's entirely appropriate for that, which is the address book. You could put into the address book, you know, Apple, if you want to get offers on the next MacBook, or Virgin America, if you want to get offers for flights because you fly Virgin America, or your favorite restaurants or movie theaters or whatever, if you want to get updates on menus or, or what's showing. The consumer, through the address book, could manage relationships, allowing brands to treat them as a, as a recipient of whatever, messages, offers, promotions, and give the consumer at the same time the right to block them if they abuse the privilege or, or to cut them off. Um, and, and it feels to me like thinking in that direction might open up something close to a pile of revenue which is at least close to an advertising model. Right. Well, I, I've always thought that negative gestures were more valuable in an information glut environment. In other words, telling people what you don't want to hear is much more efficient in terms of slowing the stream down. So, uh, if, and by the way, Facebook does have a negative gesture. It's called hide, and the newsfeed team admitted to me that when you use that, it shows you fewer items. So, if you're seeing too many gun control items, just go through and hide a bunch of them, and soon you'll see a lot fewer of those things. Right. the The downside of that is is that you uh, at a, you don't know what it is that you don't see. So you, there's, you can st it's difficult you can still to click, you can still cl click on lists and see more items uh, that are not filtered. So and then what happens? So you well click then on, you then you know you, you can no, see but, like you, your but, your brother-in-law keeps talking about gun control, and you hit him from your ne n main feed, but he's still showing up in your family feed. So if you trained people to uh, understand uh, that you were hiding yep. them. Uh, and then the algorithm worked in reverse, which is that when you uh, looked for more, uh, that they would notice that you were looking for more, and they would unhide the un the hide button uh, algorithm. Then you would have something which, if you could give that as feedback to the people that are uh, consuming your stream, uh, basically you're then telling them what you uh, are looking for in terms of their attention. There there is a feedback loop. It's just not explicit like that. Uh, what happens well, is... Well, who's going to do it? Well, it, no, Facebook is doing it already, and I'm getting that feedback loop. As I put content out, if I don't get likes or comments on certain kinds of content, 
I am being taught not to behave that way. If I want likes and comments, if I want that kind of audience, and it's hiding content, and based on everybody's likes and comments and hiding behavior. Yeah, no, I get, I get how it works uh, on the way in, but it, there's no way out from that that is. Uh, I disagree. Apparent. I disagree. How, how do you I'll, tell people? I'm sorry. You know, you really were too noisy about this for a month, but now I'm looking for you know uh, the stuff that i'm missing through the the lack of discovery uh, oh, yeah. that used to be there how do i get this guy back and how does the system know well, that well so, first of all some randomness they they always will put some random stuff in there to get to test out the theories i think the uh, whole thing is too want. random i mean i I'm, uh, i don't think so i think it's actually pretty damn brilliant i don't see that doing. i don't think that random uh, is something that we have to manufacture i think it's built into the system and I think that the uh, the randomness of intent uh, is something that we, as, as you know, information grazers, we actually are very good at picking up. Oh, I saw that. Oh, what was that thing that I saw the other day? Those kinds of signals. When we pick them up, particularly with these mobile devices, we're you know, I've been watching. We were in a uh, an advisory day. Uh, uh, with a, an analyst company uh, a couple of days ago, and I noticed that, I mean, I've been doing this for months, but I noticed that maybe 30% of the people in the room were glancing down at the uh, alert streams on, that are coming up on their, on their devices. In other words, they're not looking at the device, they're kind of absorbing that information. That stream turns out to be probably responsible for 40 percent of the most important information that you get during the day by the way I, facebook already lets you uh uh put certain notifications from your list into your mobile phone and it it, it has the best notification system so far of any of the social networks in that i want to hear from steve gilmore i don't want to hear from xyz joe blow even though I might have followed up, I follow 35,000 people on Twitter. I don't want to hear from all those people on my mobile phone. I want to hear from 10 hand-picked people and that plus uh, some other things, you know, that the system might pick for me just to, based on uh, my past behavior. We're already seeing this. I mean, uh, Prismatic, a uh, news app on the iPhone is picking freaking awesome news for me based on what I trained it to do. All right, uh, Kevin, why don't you weigh in on this and then uh, one more uh, shot from uh, the just dot. Well, I think, I think the, the selection notification thing has been around for a while. Actually, Twitter has it, but it's, it's very buried. You can, you can turn on um, notify this, um, this person on my mobile device um, for an individual somewhere in the settings, and it'll, it'll send you a little notification each time they post something. Yeah, that's there. And, but and I've got that so turned obscure. on, and I've got 158 people. Uh, so I've got a sort of mini uh, cl follow cloud now that's going for, for right. mobile, and it's very valuable. It also overruns the device and, the, and kills the battery. So uh, <laughs> obviously we need more control, not less. Of yeah, this. Right. I mean, it's like you know, it's the, the, the hacky app I wrote that does this, that it makes little notifications of other tweets on Android is, works that way too. Um, so yeah, there are the, the, it, you've got a white list of people that, that it turns into notifications, and then I need to prune it against stuff with someone who's too noisy in it. Um, so, you, you know, we go back and forth between these things. And the, the, ch the question is, um, the tension between us deciding that ourselves, who we want to hear from, and algorithms at Facebook or Google deciding which ones we get to hear from. Yeah, that's, that's the that, that, problem that, I have with, uh, with uh, Facebook is that uh, they, uh, they keep the, uh, the levers. Uh, right. Well, the, but they've added the, the no, close no, but friends that, that, You thing, see, right? that's the insight. I think uh, Kevin nailed it just then. Um, the Web 2.0 was a world where we really didn't know the end individual very well, and uh, so targeting became a requirement based on what we could learn and glean. But mobile is a world where the end individual is a known person with some known identities with a means of directly communicating with them. And in that world, Doc Searles' vision of vendor relationship management actually becomes possible on a mass scale. Yeah, but that's and, you're you're looking at the you know the the you're looking at the result and and backwards engineering the reasons for it, which uh, you know may be true, but I don't know that it is. What 
I, and what Kevin was saying that I was trying to unpack a little bit was that there's this dichotomy between the Facebook, which is uh, all powerful and sophisticated, nuanced, but invisible <laughs> to the user, and uh, just doing it yourself and then being overrun by the flow of data. And I think that there's something in the middle, which has always been true, uh, and it's the reason why Twitter's follow cloud and the whole at mention slash track model combined with follow creates this ability to be able to track not just what I'm interested in but what the people that I'm interested in are interested in and that creates a filter which is much more powerful than either of those two uh, that, you know edge conditions that you're talking about so yeah, but that is, that is not a, that's true, and uh, we all want that. But that, I think if you're talking about the ability to monetize mobile, I'm not sure that plays. No, I a, think that's. Big role. I think that you're. I think it is the monetization model. The problem is, uh, Steve, your notification needs change based on your context. If you're driving, you do not want messages that don't have anything to do with driving, unless it's your boss. Uh, who's about to fire you yeah, or it's but that's, your, that's, your wife who's about to walk hang out because you didn't do something. Hang on. This, yeah. this, is, this goes yeah. right back to, <laughs> you know, I've, I've long since given up hope that I'm going to have a system that's going to stop her from walking out the door. She's going to go. She's going to go. No, uh, they've, they've figured out how to, how to work our lives. They call us. You know? <laughs> but, By the way, I, I just got an alert from Ustream saying that we're about to go live. For, so for everyone just joining us from Ustream, You've come in towards the end of the show. Yeah, well, you can watch it on TechCrunch tomorrow. It'll be fine. Um, my my point would be that uh, the signals that you're talking about, Robert, are addendum to uh, you know location and uh, time placed, uh, you know, based on events and uh, responsibilities and commitments that you've made. Is, yeah, I don't want to see all these notifications walking around. Uh, what well, first of all. To the Google Glasses thing, I don't want to see them at all. I want, you know, the police are going to stop me for, uh, you know, you know, looking like Stevie <laughs> Wonder with, you know, glasses on. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we will be notified. The revolution will be notified. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, if you're running or sitting in a library or, uh, you know. Uh, on a date, you have different notification needs than exist right now. Right now, we get all notifications all the time. And in two or three years, we're going to have notification filtering based on our behavior in the world. When I'm skiing, I only want to see a message from you who is also skiing telling me we need to go get lunch. That's it. I don't want to see any other messages unless the world is about to end. And we already know that it's probably not going to be today. <laughs> well, it's certainly not if we're in Australia. Um, okay. Uh, I actually think uh, this has been, uh, I've been interested in, in the, this conversation, so I think others will be too. You, you were a leader on track. To, this, is, this is just a continuation of we need track. I wasn't a leader. I, I thought it was really, really good, and then they stole it. Uh, and took it away and they've never given it back and they probably yeah. won't they'll just shut down third party developers until uh, it's no longer available yeah by the way I, in London I met with the CEO of People Browser who's suing Twitter to try to keep uh, access to the Firehose stream and it, it, behind the scenes is sort of interesting Twitter told uh, People Browser to go to Ganep who has an official uh, license of the Firehose stream they did that and Ganip said Twitter asked them not to ship every tweet to them. So Ganip, oh, wow. Ganip has to uh, comply with Twitter's uh, uh, individual requests per vendor. Uh, and they'll decide, do you get really the full Firehose feed of 400 million tweets a day? Or do you get 200 million tweets a day? Or 100 million tweets a day? Or what? And so that's sort of why they were forced to sue them because there was just no way to get access to all the data anymore, for, and the, and their whole business is built on that. So, well, it's Twitter is doing better and better in terms of their uh, monetization, in terms of their uh, uh, you know potential for an IPO. 
So uh, I don't. Yeah, think... I hear. I hear they're aiming for about two to three quarters from now for an IPO. Uh -huh. Be so, interesting. And you know, and I'm very, very glad that we have a worldwide, uh, real-time information bus that we never used to have before that doesn't fail, and uh, the, this information, whether it can be collected and retrieved and uh, acted upon. Uh, right now, it's uh, largely an enterprise application. Salesforce has got a great relationship with Twitter. So, you know, the uh, I, I'm not complaining that uh, that my uh, uh, toy that I think is the coolest thing out there uh, has been taken away. Uh, it's just, you know, the price is being established. And uh, if Apple and Foursquare get together, we're going to start to see other information bases that are going to push Twitter I think to uh, unbundle some of these ser services at different uh, tiers. Speaking of tiers, last thoughts from you, Keith. Uh, thank you for a wonderful show. It's been engaging and interesting. And uh, Mr. Marks. Um, I, I think we're going to. I think we're going to go through a stage of different experimentation of, of of these different notification models and bits and pieces of those, and that is going to get very interesting very soon. Yeah. And Mr. Scoble. Uh, we're heading in a world where very personal messages are going to spray into your eye. I'm <laughs> welcoming it. <laughs> oh. Ow. <laughs> like tears in the rain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, too disgusting to. to, to, to <laughs> 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 I want to thank. Is that like uh, when the perfume kind of ladies spray perfume okay, you now, in the shop? <laughs> this was the show. Now here's the commercial. Go, go download the poke app. You can poke me. I want to thank Rackspace and particularly Rob Lejess, without which the show uh, would have been on, uh, on the air. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, New Tech and their TriCaster for making this a video show. Uh, by the way, uh, according to TechCrunch, uh, the iTunes feed, although possibly intermittent uh, uh, in terms of something to do with the length of this show from time to time, the iTunes feed has been restored, uh, so you can get the, this show on iTunes as well, uh, again. And uh, I want to thank our producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore. I want to thank... Uh, Keith Tier, who just left. I want to thank Kevin Marks. I want to thank Robert Scoble. And uh, I, I encourage everybody to run over to This Week in uh, Startups to see if he adds any additional value. No. <laughs> Say hi to Jason for me. Uh, I will. Thanks to everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't. We'll see you again next time. Bye bye. <laughs>